Well, this is the Farm Doc Daily Live Coronavirus and Ag webinar series, the final in our series. This is the 20th of our programs, Coronavirus and the Pork Industry, Perspectives from the Mash-Offs. I'm University of Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. Our panelists for the day are Dr. Bradley Walter and Gary Schnitke. We're going to start off with a quick poll for the day. So I appreciate it if Jim Boltz, who is our director, direct, technical director, would bring that up. Do you expect more large supply disruptions in the hog uh, and beef industries? And you're going to answer that question in this form. One of these, uh, I expect more plants will be slowed in the next three months, processing disruptions to continue into the next year, or a return to more normal processing capabilities. Take a moment and fill out uh, the answer to that question on this poll. We'll show you what the answers are as soon as we get to about 70% of you to uh, put in an answer at this point. So again, do you expect more large supply disruptions in the hog and beef industries? I expect one, more plants will slow be slowed in the next three months. Processing disruptions to continue to the end of the year or a return to more normal processing capabilities. And it looks like we've got about 65, 66% of the vote in. We're almost there, 67%. I kind of like to get to 70%. So go ahead and keep voting and we'll see how we do here. All right, so we have people coming in. A couple hundred folks are in on the webinar at the moment. Here's the way the distribution looks. Pretty much a bell curve, 20% of you say more plants will be slowed in the next three months. Half of you are thereabouts. Processing disruptions will continue into the next year. And 27% say return to normal processing capability. So that's the poll for the day. Let's turn our attention now to Gary Schnitke. He's an agricultural economist here on the Urbana-Champaign campus at the University of Illinois. He's going to walk us through uh, a few things on CFAP. This is the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program USDA is using as the direct payment system. Uh, that farmers will be able to sign up for next week. Good morning to you, Gary. Thank you so much. Why don't you go ahead and get started with your first slide for the day? Yeah, thank you, Todd. And as you, as everybody probably knows, CFAP rules were announced this week. They were announced on Wednesday. And just a couple of notes. We're not going to talk about that too much today, there. But there will be a Farm Doc Daily article available today that has just been written that will hit the Farm Doc Daily website later today. And next Tuesday at 7 a.m., we will have our updated perspectives on the pandemic and policy responses. We will go into much more detail on that at that point in time. And uh, and just a reminder that this is that you will have to re register for that webinar. That is not part of this series. Uh, just a couple notes here. There's a $250,000 payment limit and a 900,000 AGI test as well. The CFAT payments for crops. There's a there 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 were a lot of lot of details released on the uh, on this. And if we can go to the next slide, well, I'll show show those to you. But uh, there's a lot of confusion out out there about what those those look like. We're just going to give go through a simple example here. Again, you will begin to be able to sign up for this program next week. Overall, though, for corn, there will be a 33 and a half cent payment based on the lower of 2019 production. So 2019 production, 50 percent of that, or the lower of that, or the unpriced inventory on January 15th. So if we had a farm that produced 200 bushels of corn last year, the maximum payment that they could be received on is 100 bushels. And if we have 140 bushels in inventory on January 15th, that's unpriced, we'll get paid on 150, 100 bushels maximum, which will work out to be 33.50 an acre. Three, or excuse me, $33.50 per acre. And that will come in two installments, 26.80 or 80% of that. And then a second payment of 670 later if the funding exists. So those that's the basic details of the crop program. Uh, there is also substantial payments for cattle, hogs, and dairy. If we go to the next slide, we'll show you those rates. Um, they will be paid on sales between January 15th and April 14th, and then paid on the highest inventory number between the dates of April 16th to May 14th. So there for slaughter cattle, for example, if we sold some cattle 
on January 15th to April 14th. That'll be paid at $214 per head rate, and then any inventory at a $33 rate. You can see there there are so there are payments that are also for hogs. So a segment of the hog industry will will receive some payments. Uh, there is also a payment on milk production, 618 per hundredweight. If we go to the next slide, and again, we will provide more detail on, 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 on that next week. But here, just to give a, set this up, we're going to be talking about the hog industry today. And this slide shows actual hog slaughter, um, five-year average 2019 and 2020. And... The big note there is that sharp decline from uh, April to May. And if we hit that little slider, you'll, you'll see that there. Um, this is a substantial decline. We were actually looking at uh, production well above average at the 20, beginning of 2020. And now we're well below it. Those hogs did not go away. They're still out there in many cases. Um, and... The uh, hog industry is, uh, has bred hogs amazingly well so that if they even just look at feed, they just keep growing. Anyway, that has caused a great deal of issues. And just to give you a feel for that, um, we looked at cash prices of early wean pigs. So this would be a roughly 10 to 20 pound pig. La yesterday or last week, they were seven twenty a pound, uh, per head, which is substantially below the thirty to thirty five dollar average that they're likely at. And the composite cash and, and formula price were fifteen twenty. So we could show a lot of prices for the hog industry, and 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 and, and this is a a small segment of the hogs that went through the the, the that that the early wean pig or pricing at that point in time, but it does show you the substantial adjustments that are going on in the hog industry. So with that, now one of the people that probably has an opinion on this joins us from the mash offs in Carlisle, Illinois. His name is Bradley Walter. He is the CEO and president there. Uh, first, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and then take us through the slide set, please, Bradley. Thank you for being with us, by the way. Well, Todd, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I uh, am a Southern Illinois farm boy, and and I'm I'm actually back at home after uh, a stint at the University of Illinois. Uh, I uh, received a bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees in in uh, at, at the university uh, under uh, the direction of Dr. Mike Ellis and uh, Dr. Snick. He was actually on my thesis committee, so I'm certainly a debt of gratitude uh, to those gentlemen and, and those professors. Um, I actually uh, got introduced to the Mashoffs uh, during my master's PhD work. I collect a lot of data in their system, and um, here I am uh, about uh, 25 years later. Uh, after starting that journey, uh, they were very uh, open to having me uh, collect data that I needed for uh, my, my research thesis. And uh, along the way, I, I joined them as I wrapped up those activities. Uh, initially joined as a, as a the person responsible for the technical programs, and uh, as as we evolved and, and grew our business, uh, I assumed uh, the, the leadership role in operations, and uh, as of uh, about five years ago, uh, took over the strategic uh, role of uh, chief executive officer and and uh, leading leading the company from there. I uh, uh, want to emphasize, you know, uh, about our family. We're like many Illinois farm families, very conservative uh, in preserving uh, the, the the balance sheet and and uh, spend a lot of time thinking about risk management. So you'll hear that uh, as I make uh, my comments today. I want to take uh, a few minutes uh, with the audience and and set up uh, what we've referred to as our Mashoff family food system. Uh, we've uh, we've actually made investments through time in, in poultry production, uh, as well as some other uh, businesses inside the animal protein space. Uh, today, we're back to exclusively focusing uh, in in pork production. That's our our core uh, uh, at a, at our core, and, and certainly our core competency. And so, my my point is, we've we've been bullish, and we remain bullish. Uh, animal protein. Uh, we recognize, though, that within that space, there's a tremendous amount of risk uh, and, and always has been, always will be. And, of course, the challenge that we see is how we manage those risks going forward. And, and so a little bit about our system and how we think about that. Uh, we've uh, both 
backwards and forwards integrated. Um, we've, we're a traditional commodity uh, pork production supply chain, uh, complete uh, ferro to, to finish operation. We backward integrated into a proprietary genetic investment. So we have our own genetic lines and, and we do have some outside sales of, of those animals. And then all the way through uh, to our uh, customer portfolio, which in the main uh, are, are three customers that uh, everybody on this call would be familiar with, Smithfield, Hormel and JBS. And uh, very proud to call ourselves partners uh, with, with those folks. Uh, but we've also uh, ventured into uh, a, a private label, Mashaw Family Farms. Uh, we uh, harvest uh, about 10% of our production uh, that we brand, and, and uh, it keeps us focused on uh, a farm-to-table experience. We're very proud, uh, as you'll hear throughout my comments, very proud and passionate about what we do. And we recognize at the end of the day, uh, there's a consumer at, at the end of the process, and that uh, is, you know, really at the core of, of how we think about the business. A few high points uh, to scope my conversation this morning. We're headquartered in, in Carlisle, Illinois, and uh, but we do have operations that span seven states. Uh, the, the whole of those operations involve about uh, 600 uh, production sites or farms, if you will, uh, and uh, we run uh, what we call a network of family family farms. So we've got about a little over 400 families that, that operate the, the farms uh, in conjunction with, with our uh, production practices and guidelines, which again, all line up to uh, our customer's expectation. And, and in total, this puts us in a situation to uh, produce about 4 million pigs uh, across a diversified uh, customer portfolio. Uh, of course, at the core of, of anything you do operationally, it's about the people. And, and we've got, uh, in order to do that, in addition to the family farmers uh, that, that are a part of what we do, uh, we own and operate uh, the, the, the south side of our business. And, and it takes about 1,100 employees uh, to operate our uh, just short of 200,000 sows today. Uh, at the core of our risk management, of course, uh, is, is managing our price, and that begins uh, with uh, a devote focus to, to our customer base. We begin the process with the end in mind, uh, and I think about that also in terms of how we, uh, how we, how we breed and genetically improve the pig. We, we start with the end in mind, and that's absolutely critical. We focused here over the last couple of decades really on building a supply chain competency, and you'll see that that becomes really critical as we find ourselves in the midst of this COVID crisis. Um, and, and so for us, it's, it's, it's always about what is the customer need from us? Uh, we're, we're deeply engaged with what are the product specs and, and, and generally, of course, in, in, in what I call a commodity plus business. So we recognize we've got to compete uh, on, on a cost basis and at the same time, uh, we've got to differentiate ourselves, and that's largely done through services and, and product quality and ensuring uh, that, that we meet supply standards. And we'll talk a little bit more here in just a split second about the science-based approach uh, to, to how we do that. And so um, to that end, uh, we've focused really hard on, on no different than any of uh, the producers involved in animal ag or, or row crop production today. Uh, we recognize and inside this commodity space, you've got to have an integrated cost solution based approach, at least in our opinion. And for us, that's first with a solid science based R&D platform. And so we work and collaborate with the University of Illinois and, and uh, particularly the Department of Animal Science, Dr. Mike Ellis's program. Uh, we, we have a foundation of which we, we leverage um, a number of resources, including uh, those that we have here internally and, and at the university uh, to, to ask a lot of questions of the biology of our system. We're constantly looking to CIP, uh, continuous improve and, and better understand. Uh, we focus on the marginal economic uh, unit uh, involved with any biological output. And so that allows us to make informed uh, decisions as we go forward. Uh, we continue to build the team out that allows us to do that. And of course we can't, do it ourselves. So not only do we have the uh, relationships with the university, but numerous other allied industry partners that we leverage the expertise of. And again, I want to emphasize that from my perspective, us navigating this COVID crisis has, has hinged entirely upon this sort of cost solution based platform that we've built. 
the the knowledge of again the marginal economic unit uh, as well as uh, drawing on a deep understanding of, of biology. And in this case, the biology of growth, as I'll talk a little bit about. Um, and uh, the, the key thing I want to emphasize is that while we've made those investments uh, and, and we operate this innovation platform, it's, it's only as good as the teams on our farms. It still comes down uh, to flawless execution of our operations. And, and that's absolutely key. And, and to that end, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that, you know, the key to our, our success is the network of family farms that we work with across the seven states in which we operate. We've got a map there giving you an idea of, of where we operate. I've, I've put some perspective of how wage rates differ around the company from our, our set of lenses. And, and it's relevant because as we get into co the, the discussion on COVID and its impact on the pork industry, you'll see that that really it's it's the labor constraint uh, that's caused by not only the illness itself, but but some of the uh, the solutions that we've put in place to stabilize uh, the economy that that's also wreaked uh, havoc uh, or certainly instability in terms of our 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 uh, our labor supply in, inside the pork industry. But again. Uh, we uh, we focus uh, with with these 407 production partners, uh, which are taking pigs from 21 days of age from our, our what we call breed to wean farms. Uh, we wean those animals out into these production partners uh, farms, and and they of course implement and execute work in collaboration with our advisors uh, to rear these pigs up to a target weight today. I say target weight. Um, of about uh, 285 pounds live weight, uh, roughly a, a 210 pound carcass weight. And, and so as I get into what we're doing to manage this situation, uh, it would be remiss if I didn't say it, it's really the, the, the work, the hard work of our partner families uh, that are getting this done. And, and uh, it's been amazing, the level of cooperation that we've received and commitment. Let's before we get into COVID, I want to set up the situation. And Dr. Schnick, he uh, did an incredible job of, of lining out the macro picture at the U.S. level. I think for me, it starts at yet a higher level than that. Uh, as you look around the globe, uh, we've been growing the global pork industry dramatically on, on top of what has been uh, the last decade, pretty dramatic GDP growth. And we've seen it particularly in Southeast Asia. And so the industry around the globe, particularly in the the, the, the parts of the world that compete on a cost competitive basis, not only in the US, but South America, uh, Eastern Bloc of Europe, Russia and China have continued to expand their sow base. And, uh, and, and what's happened here in US in particular is a significant number of, of plants have gone in, packing plants, uh, five uh, specifically have gone in recently as the US has participated uh, in that rapid expansion of the industry as we've seen the opportunity to market more pork as GDP increases, uh, everyone sort of uh, with, with strong balance sheets would have been generally profitable times uh, have looked to redeploy capital. And uh, we've netted uh, really coming into this year, USDA hogs and pigs report would have indicated uh, upwards of a 7% increase in, in total hogs coming into the year. And uh, of course we've built to here in the US uh, the, the growth of the industry is predicated on, on the assumption that there will be export demand. Uh, we, we're needing, based on historical consumption in the U.S., we're needing to export about a third of our production. And so uh, African swine fever in China, uh, while uh, on one hand it remains a very significant risk here and to our industry in the U.S., uh, it would certainly be, uh, would be a straw that broke the camel's back right now, I assure you. And, and uh, uh, but uh, it's also uh, the paradox is that it's, it's the opportunity for us at the moment, uh, given the uh, demand in China. So at, at the current moment, the export of pork to China has been absolutely critical uh, to, 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 to actually our response in COVID and certainly uh, to maintaining any hope uh, for, for profit, profitability in this industry given the rapid expansion that's occurred. So uh, coronavirus obviously is, is the thing that's most impacting us as we look here at, uh, in a second at, at what's happened in U.S. packing. I should uh, indicate that uh, as we grew the sow herd, I mentioned we, we grew packing plants, we expanded the industry, 
And one of the challenges along the way of those packing plants has been to find the labor resources uh, to put the human capital in place to run those plants at capacity. So this increase in total hog volume, uh, we, we hadn't really solved the riddle yet uh, to, to harvest the pigs. And there was a lot of, of angst and concern as we got out into the fourth quarter uh, here in, in 2020, uh, would we be able to harvest all the pigs that, that we had in, we are anticipating uh, to produce. And so this is before COVID had, had set, its, uh, set its head on us. Um, and, and so uh, obviously finishing capacity, the point is the finishing capacity in the US industry was tight prior to COVID. And so uncertainty was the theme prior to COVID. And so you can imagine it's, uh, it remains the theme and exponentially so at the moment. So let's talk about COVID in the context of the pig industry. And again, this is from the mash ops perspective. Um, you know, it's certainly a pandemic. On top of that, it's become the paradox uh, for us. And, and I remember uh, when I assembled my team uh, as we began to learn and we talked about should we form a task force exactly, how should we uh, brought my team together and talked about it. I, I remember challenging them with the, the, the notion that I thought this could really be the challenging question to large food systems. And this could really, uh, could really challenge systems as we know them today. And of course, uh, we've, we've, we've built food systems on the basis of efficiency and there's always trade-offs. And, and so as we build systems on the basis of efficiency, um, you know, that there, there creates some perhaps additional vulnerability as, as we've seen play out. But the particular paradox is that on top of this uh, large number of, of pigs we've got, uh, all time record uh, highs of live hogs, um, at the same point in time, here we sit with empty store shelves. And so how did, uh, how did that happen? In fact, uh, you'll, you'll, the picture to the, the right hand corner of the screen is us testing a methodology for euthanizing in a system for euthanizing pigs while store shelves sit empty. And, and so, you know, of course this came about as, as the virus broke, uh, no, I certainly wasn't uh, uh, savvy enough to recognize that I, you know, we would see the entire industry really get challenged. I envision and remember having a conversation with the team that we would need to learn how to manage the growth of our animals because I anticipated that a plant would have trouble and I envisioned it would go down for a short period of time and come back up. And so how would we manage the, the, the situation under those circumstances? What I didn't see, uh, what I'm sure everybody on this call now recognizes is that, um, you know, the, the entire system in the U.S., multiple plants were affected and generally speaking at, at the same time to the to the point that we had uh, at one point you know less than 60 percent uh, less than than 50 percent of plant capacity um, and and of course once you lose that capacity you don't get it back quickly um, and it's it's brought back to the forefront uh, animal ag uh, activists those that 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 don't share our views that, that meat protein is indeed an, an important uh, nutrient substance for a growing uh, society. So we, uh, when, when we were made aware of COVID, we began to see um, businesses outside, particularly in urban areas, uh, develop COVID uh, responses. We too at that time enacted a COVID task force. And, and we focused on what we saw as the key risk. I already talked to you about the fact that, you know, we've tried to design the company to anticipate risk. Uh, again, uh, wide ge geographical footprint. We've located our breeding herds outside of the growing dense areas of the Midwest. Uh, we've, we've taken the approach of multiple customers, multiple products that we're selling from wean pigs to some genetic animals to, uh, obviously uh, commodity uh, market pigs. And so um, that's been our approach to rich management. And, and, and we obviously from, from both business and financial risk point of view. And so when, when the team gets together and, and thinks about how do we manage COVID-19, we took a similar multifaceted approach. Um, first and foremost, we're always concerned at protecting our, our people and protecting our teammates. And so uh, we, we've had to think about uh, uh, the, the potential to lose uh, teammates and the potential, frankly, for an entire team at a farm. 
uh, or even within a pod, so a group of farms in a given geography. Uh, and so we had uh, contingency plans in all those cases that we quickly built. Um, and we've been fortunate through this process that we've not had to uh, enact them to any great extent. We, we, we have had positive uh, cases of, of employees actually across our footprint. Uh, we were impacted uh, to a meaningful extent in Nebraska. And again, we, we triggered some contingency in that case, but uh, really important that we're connected and continue to communicate with our team. We also uh, felt strongly about focusing again on, on our core competency, making sure our customers were successful through this process. That was really important to us. And uh, we, we've thought at all times about how do we continue, what can we do to make sure that we maximize available plant capacity uh, inside of our custom harvest plant at Pine Ridge Farms in Des Moines, where we, we uh, manage uh, our, our, our label, the product with our own label. Uh, we, we've used that and work very, very closely and try and use that as, as uh, a means of flexing the system uh, while making sure that our core customer group uh, gets the pigs they need or, or we can manage through at times that they don't need it. And so enabling that, of course, is that we've got to control the growth of our animals. When you lose uh, the opportunity to harvest those pigs, as Dr. Snicky referenced, they're growing. They're growing. Uh, uh, they're not sitting on a shelf and they don't volunteer to stop. We've, of course, uh, been selecting these animals for lean growth rate throughout the entire uh, the entire 25 years that I've been a part of the, pr the program. And so uh, we think about how we improve the rate of growth and, 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 and capture the, the animal's genetic potential through our animal care programs every day. And so we're not in a, in a strong position, we're capable because we know the biology, but not in a strong position to think about how we reverse that process. And that's what this has been for us. And so we've in, uh, in implemented diet and management uh, uh, strategies to control the growth. And of course, we have to monitor that very closely. And now as we start to get plant capacity to come back on, the trick is to, 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 to let, it, uh, let it back out. So we've been meeting as a task force uh, daily uh, to, uh, to, to manage the various indices that we're watching and, and ultimately make management decisions based on that. Of course, space management, as I mentioned, we've got a growing industry. We're essentially uh, behind on the space needs uh, to begin with because of the resulting growth of, of, the, uh, of the industry. Now, we've chose not to grow uh, in recent times while the industry was growing rapidly. We, we, we've chose to, to manage and continue to improve uh, our efficiencies uh, in, in the absence of strong growth. And, and so we were in a really, we, we've been and will continue to be in a very strong uh, space position. Uh, and we've not run out of space at, at this particular point in time. And, and finally, um, we've, uh, we have also had to gear up and get ready for a euthanasia event because again, in, in the world of unknown, will plants meet the needs of the industry. What do we do with the animals that we can't um, get harvested? And, and so that's been incredibly emotional and tough, tough situation on our team. The, the crisis highlighted the various risks um, throughout the industry. And, and obviously, first and foremost for us is consumer demand. We're very concerned that as the financial times set in, the demand won't be there for our products. And of course, uh, the supply chain factor fact that we don't have uh, the labor in place in these plants uh, to run uh, harvest capacities at near the norm uh, on the backside of those harvest capacities, of course, is the fabrication. And so we're literally um, sending out a lot of primals, heavy bone in primals. And what does the average consumer do with that at the moment? And I'm concerned uh, that in the absence of that knowledge, we could see consumption go down. And, and so, you know, and, and then again, what does the new normal look like as it relates to consumer demand as a result of some of these factors? Uh, harvest capacity is, is at the heart of all of this, as is, is I'm sure all the listeners on this webinar are well aware um, that the challenges inside of the COVID uh, event, that what's happened inside the plants, uh, the absence of testing and the ability uh, to, to manage the spread. Um, of course, uh, our customers did an outstanding job in our minds stepping in um, and, and doing what they could as it unfolded. But at the end of the day, we lost capacity and there's today 3 million pig backlog. And government support, and Dr. Schnicky was talking about that in the context of, of both animal and row crop earlier, 
but the reality of it is is that there are significant limitations uh, on on size and and uh, our concern is that it ultimately reduces the competitiveness of systems that are already out here and for example, we've not benefited from any of the government programs. We have found a very, uh, very supportive uh, governments around the, the footprints in, in which we operate and supportive of helping us think about how we might euthanize and, and bringing institutions like FEMA uh, to the table, particularly in the state of Illinois. Um, and so we're, we're still working on those. And, and so again, um, but uh, there, there is real risk in my mind if we don't manage these programs uh, responsibly going forward. And then, of course, you've got environmental, the workforce pieces we've talked about. And uh, I'm very concerned over the long term is, uh, about the availability of the workforce. Um, it's, it's certainly reduced today. Um, and uh, I'm concerned in the long term, um, depending on, again, how, how, how long um, you, you can see, I guess, two, two major factors I want to point out uh, in addition to uh, the concerns around working in tight areas, um, but, but some of the incentives uh, to, to create a, a robust economy certainly compete against the, the available workforce uh, for us, as well as some of the uh, isolationist views. I mean, the, the uh, pork industry relies heavily on, on, on an immigrant uh, uh, workforce, particularly in the in the packing plants and and programs uh, sanctioned by the government to support that, and and so those are all unknowns and and something we continue to monitor and and need the support of uh, fr from our government bodies. And finally, you know, capital is a real concern. I talk about our partners. We want a we need a healthy rural fabric, and of course, financial liquidity on the backside of all this is important for all of us, but certainly in, in, in our farm-based economy. With all that said, I'm, I'm, I'm really moving forward with opti op optimism. Uh, certainly we here as a company, we found that necessity is, is the mother of invention. That's frequently said, uh, but, but I see this as an opportunity for us to position the business for better resilience. We've learned a lot through this. We've tested systems. We hope to never have to test, um, but uh, without question, we see an evolving market on the back side of this, and, and our goal is to put ourselves in a position to participate in that market with more knowledge uh, and the resiliency to capture it. Uh, I, again, I feel strongly, our organization, the family feels that, you know, you've got to have the best team, and, and this has certainly uh, uh, been an opportunity for us to continue to develop people. Uh, and, and on the back side of this, you know, we're going to have to focus on retaining those, those folks uh, because, again, it, it's the people that allow us to, to, to you know, maintain our cost-efficient position. We, uh, we also, I think, better understand today the, the importance of our service to our, our customers. We've always understood that, but uh, we've tried to really be partners through this process. And so now we turn to, you know, the opportunity on the back side of this is, is understand what they need from us in a new normal. And uh, we, we look forward to having a better understanding and ultimately a deeper relationship as a result. Uh, and uh, of course, we've got to continue to evaluate and manage risk. Uh, we, we've uncovered new risk uh, and uh, it, it forces us to take a look at, at the biology that we yet to understand about the pigs and, and how we might exploit that uh, to, to, to help create a more reliable supply chain. And, and finally, it's certainly cultivated, uh, and, and I think you know, the opportunity remains for us to continue to cultivate our passion for animal care. Um, you know, this, is, uh, this has been tough. I've re often reminded my organization, we're essential. We, we produce really important substance for, for this country and the world. And uh, I think we've really rallied around the fact that it's been so rewarding to wake up each day with this responsibility. And uh, with that, uh, I want to thank you, Todd and Gary, for the opportunity, and uh, I'll, I'll turn it back. to you. Well, thank you so much, Bradley, for being with us today. Now, if you have questions for Bradley, you can write them in those question boxes there over to the left-hand side if you're on a desktop, probably down at the bottom of the page if you're on a smaller device, and we'll get to them momentarily. We would like to thank all of our FarmDoc sponsors. You know, it takes a public-private partnership to really make this work, and our sponsors have helped out tremendously throughout the 20 different webinars that we have produced over the 
last couple of months, including Compare Financial, Farm Credit Illinois, FS Growmark, the Illinois Corn Growers Association, and the TIAA Center for Farmland Research, along with uh, the Department of Agricultural and Consumer Economics here in the College of Agricultural, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences. Again, that public-private partnership is really, really important to us, and it's paid off in this way. There have been about uh, 3,000 registrants for our program over the last, oh, since March the 20th, the first one, if you bring up the next slide, took place on that date, uh, thereabouts, and we'll end with this one today in this coronavirus and ag series. Again, nearly 3,000 people have registered, uh, 7,005 had to have attended, so if you added the attendance together across the whole of the 20, that's uh, more than 7,000 people. There have been 20 webinars, 26 presenters, 10 of them from the FarmDoc team, meaning they came from the University of Illinois and uh, the FarmDoc team here on the Urbana-Champaign campus of the U of I, including Nick Polson, Gary Schnitke, Jonathan Coppa, Scott Irwin, Todd Hubbs, Bob Ray, Dale Latz, and of course, Jim Baltz, who's the technical director, and myself, Todd Gleason. Um, our thanks to all of the folks from the FarmDoc team that have put this together because it has been a really truly a uh, great series from my perspective. Uh, there are some upcoming webinars. Now you'll need to register again for these and you'll have to go to go.illinois.edu slash FD. Bring up the next slide, please. Again, that's go.illinois.edu slash FD. On uh, Tuesday of next week, and this one will start at 7 a.m., Gary Schnicki, Nick Paulson, and Jonathan Coppice will take you through the pandemic policy responses. I believe, Gary, this is where you'll be doing the CFAP update and many other things as well. If you want to register, again, you have to pre-register for that one. Well, your registration for this one has now ended, so you have to go back and to uh, do this again. And then on the 29th, and I think this will be a separate registration as well, the folks from the FBFM, that's next Friday, will be back with an income and expense estimate for Illinois farms. And some summary, that one starts at nine o'clock in the morning. Now, thank you so much for being with us. Let's get to some of the questions that folks have asked. And I'll start actually, Excellent. Bradley, with a question that popped into my mind as you were going through your discussion. You said that the consumer might not know what to do with the primal cuts. Um, can you uh, talk a bit more about what that means? And you can turn your webcam on too, so folks will be able to see you. Sure. One of the one of the things we've learned, Todd, uh, very early on is obviously when we close food service, um, we were, uh, you know, retail had a run and, and uh, everybody's well aware of that. The, the, the first weekend, uh, retail had a significant run and, and our customer base uh, demanded, you know, about 15 percent uh, increase in, in orders to us. So we we sold about 15 percent more pigs and it took about three days on the backside of that process uh, for bellies to stack up uh, head high in, in, in our in, in our customers' plants and they had to slow the harvest down because uh, bellies go primarily to food service and I'm exaggerating a bit, but not by a lot. And so, you know, there was already the first kink in the supply chain very early on in the process. And uh, it's been a series of, of discoveries along the way since then. Um, and, and so the next one that really came about as, as labor became constrained along the way, um, you know, you have to, uh, to keep the harvest going. They're moving people from the, what they call the cut floor, uh, where the products are fabricated to the harvest end of, of the plant. And so there's less fabrication happening. And so, uh, in, in actual fact, uh, it's, it's, um, uh, accelerated the sale of, of, pork to China because the Chinese generally buy what's called a six-piece carcass or a three-piece side. And so you, obviously there's not a lot of processing there. And so it's quickly to get those pigs through the plant uh, and uh, into combos that, 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 that then go to China. And so um, that, that's been uh, a blessing in many ways that the, the, the increase in China demand is as a result of the ASF epidemic in their country. Um, however, it, it's probably uh, 
you know, certainly moved a lot of uh, U.S. supply uh, out of consumers' hands. And and so um, the the bottom line is to your question that uh, you know it's been a dynamic situation, and uh, as labor comes back, we'll, we'll further fabricate uh, primals more into boneless cuts and things like uh, sliced chops that you would buy pre-packed in, in the grocery store. Uh, but there was certainly a, a period of time here two, three weeks ago that that was, was just not, not happening and, and not able. And so you, you get concerned that, uh, um, when, when the consumer goes to the store and they find this, you know, huge, um, you know, rib in loin, uh, that's, uh, you know, 12 pounds, what do they do with it? And, uh, you know, do they turn to an alternative protein at that time and, and have a pleasurable experience and never come back? On that note, the integrators, usually on the poultry side, have been less impacted by COVID, I think, than the pork industry. Maybe you have uh, some thoughts on that. And is there anything from that side of the industry that can be put into place in the pork processing plants or through the integration that might be worthwhile? You know, Todd, my, my actual belief is that, you know, COVID uh, has, is, has been the enemy to everyone. It, it has not chose uh, its foe on the basis of size or, or level of integration. Um, certainly, as I you know, tried to point out in the way that we designed our systems, I think their, their producers, irrespective of size and business model that, that have thought through the risk elements of their business, or, or in other words, you know, designed into their system ways of managing risk. And I think for those that have designed uh, the capability to, to manage risk into their system, uh, they've been able to uh, manage it a bit better than those that haven't. And, and again, that's not to say that, that those that didn't have the risk management for this particular situation may not have it for another. Uh, and I'll give you an example. There, there are several. Obviously, I've mentioned, tried to, to layer a few thoughts in as it relates to us being multi-geography. We really got there as a result of biosecurity or, or protecting herd health. We never wanted to have our pig population in any one concentrated geography. Um, and, and in this case, it, it's worked out as well uh, for the same reason. It just happens to be human health this time relative to pig health. Um, but the one thing that's unique about our system, and I mentioned my work uh, oversaw by Dr. Mike Ellis as a student, was, was work with wean to finish barns. And for those listeners that are familiar with the pig industry, that was a technology that, that came about in the late 90s where we actually took barns designed for finishing pigs uh, and began to put nursery pigs in them. And so there were some design changes needed. And the immediate question uh, was, how should we uh, stock them? How should we best utilize that space? It's a significant capital investment uh, for a period of time that could be underutilized. And so we've designed our entire system of that technology on the basis that it allowed us the flexibility to routinely manage to uh, a fixed weight system, uh, which our customers uh, tell us they need a, a fixed carcass weight for their products, which I think is probably intuitive to most of us. And uh, so then we've got to deal with things like seasonality, uh, disease, and other factors that change the growth of, of our animals. And so We've designed that capability in our system. Um, a lot of other producers probably designed a system on the basis of fixed time. Uh, and so the, the barns turn on a fixed time basis and that has certain other characteristics that have benefits. And so, um, you know, I really don't think COVID selected uh, size and scale. Um, it, 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 it impacted all of us. Um, some of us differently, depending on the investments and the degree of, of risk mitigation that we designed into our systems. On the risk side, you mentioned fist, fixed weight. Part of the problem, as I understand it, is the plants, once the pig or hog would get big enough, cannot actually bring the hog in for slaughter. Um, what problem is related there? And is that where euthanasia would take place? And what, what's the cost behind that? Yeah, that's a really great, uh, great point, Todd. So yes, uh, the, the U.S. 
generally, in fact, I'm not aware of many plants, if any, that, that don't have uh, CO2 stunning as uh, the, the method of euthanasia. And uh, that involves a carousel-like device. It uh, looks like a Ferris wheel that goes into, uh, obviously, CO2, a heavy gas in, in a pit. And so the pigs have to fit into the carousel. And when they, they no longer do, um, you put not only their welfare at risk, but, but obviously you put the plant at risk from a mechanical point of view. And so um, there just simply cannot be pigs that are, that are too large for those carousels. And, and uh, you know, 25 years ago, we've been able to manage much larger pigs through the process, but because of that method, we no longer can. Um, and so there in lies the issue today uh, that, uh, you know, if you're unable to control the growth of your animals, those, those animals are growing outside of that window where we can mechanically process them in today's uh, plants. And uh, what's, what's had to happen is, uh, and, and, and I would say the one thing that the U.S. has been preparing for, and it's actually, you know, helped us a great deal here, is we've been preparing for African swine fever in this country. And the primary challenge we've all been trying to solve is, is if you were to get it, how would you dispose of those animals and those carcasses? And so the industry has been sleeves rolled up for a period of three to five years, really anticipating that. And so we, we drew on that work um, and, and the industry's come together as well. I, we, we actually personally here designed a, a, a euthanization trailer that's mobile and can get to farms. Uh, and uh, the pork board actually uh, supported us with, with some funding uh, to build those. Once we had the, the blueprint design and, and tested it, we, we've actually built some others that we've shared not only within Illinois, but in other states. Uh, just as one example, there are other methods of euthanization, euthanasia that's being deployed. Um, but obviously, you know, those of us out here with pig populations that the animals are growing past that stage, You've got a real challenge, not only in, in the physical element of, of how do you destroy what could be as many as, as, as 24,000 pigs on a given site, uh, but more importantly, what do you do with that biomass? Um, notwithstanding, is uh, the real cost, I think, is the emotional turmoil on you know, our caregivers that have you know, taken you know, great lengths to rear the pigs. And, and so... You know, there's a degree of of, of immeasurability uh, to, to to the question, uh, but certainly financially, you know, our estimates would be uh, as much as about forty six to fifty dollars a head uh, of, of disposal cost, um, and and that probably doesn't capture the other costs associated with you know getting teams and and things uh, through the euthanization process. Uh, and as I mentioned in my, my slides, I'm, I'm also concerned that, you know, it, it, it's such a burden to deal with that, that we, we as an industry have to be extremely responsible uh, with, with that, that, that biomass. And, and, uh, and, and so it's, it's a real challenge and, and tough for me, at least, to, to completely quantify. Have your feed rations had to change because of COVID-19? And does that impact meat quality? That's a great question, and uh, they have had to change, and we've tried to manage our nutrition platform uh, to minimize any impacts to meat quality. Um, and so we've gone to great lengths. Again, we, we have uh, several PhD nutritionists on staff, and we leverage an allied industry partner uh, in this process as well. Uh, and uh, so we've, we've designed a nutritional platform that we believe won't change the, the meat quality properties, uh, but, but certainly we're changing the composition of growth on these animals. And so we are changing, uh, we're likely to be changing some, some lean to fat ratios. The pigs are, are, uh, are probably going to be a, a bit leaner as a result of restricting the growth. They, they don't have the energy to put on and deposit additional fat. And, and so... Um, we're, uh, you know, that, that will be a consequence of, of this through this narrow window of time. And, uh, we are getting to the point where, you know, we're starting to let some of the pigs grow 
again at, at nearing you know near near normal rates. But the problem that I see is that you know this isn't going to be solved overnight. I know you had the polling questions. Um, we fully anticipate, as I mentioned, we've got a, we've got an industry that that is uh, poised for you know let's call it 10% over over last year. And, you know, we've not been able to harvest the sows through this process. So, you know, there, there are disease events that have been occurring where, you know, the economics would indicate we should depopulate those sows, but you cannot physically get them killed. Um, and, and so you can't get them harvested in, in today's environment because of the capacity constraints. Uh, I suspect there, there may also be you know, financial perils on in some farms that, that are, you know, on that basis needing to liquidate and you just cannot uh, get them harvested. So the pigs are continuing to come. Um, there, there are uh, some approaches being taken to euthanize some of the pigs early prior to weaning oh, at birth and in some instances uh, as a result of, of, of the situation. Uh, and, and, and it's actually the most humane way to deal with this crisis. Um, but, uh, you know, again, it, that's a challenging thing to do as, as you think about the investment and again, the emotional investment that, that our caregivers have in this process. And so generally speaking, you know, the pigs continue, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to be put into the pipeline. And you again, mentioned. three, three million head of backlog at the moment. And, uh, you know, euthanization on farm is happening. It's happening every day. And I, I would also say, Todd, that, you know, I expect, you know, the worst days yet to come as it relates to that. Okay. So, so a couple of questions. These are all related to feed. Um, so, sows and hogs are all being fed to heavier weights, I suppose, uh, or the sows on maintenance, if, but they're still being fed and you're still putting piglets into the system. How does feed demand change, if at all? Yeah, we we good question. Is we operate three large company-owned mills uh, that manufacture upwards of four hundred thousand ton a year for for some perspective, and we've seen a reduction by as much as twenty percent of feed production in those mills um, during during this time. So feed production is up, but I just want to remind you that you know we've we've gone our pigs have gone for about twelve days. Uh, on a, on a, where they haven't gained and they haven't lost a pound. So you you know while total feed production is down and, and consumption down, uh, there's no return on the investment we're making either. Uh, we, we're feeding them at maintenance and and uh, we've obviously got you know assets tied up to do that in terms of farms and people. What do you see in efficiencies that the industry might adopt, whether it's in artificial intelligence or robotics or other items? Yeah, really, really good question. Um, it's too early for me to prognosticate on that. Um, I'm not sure, you know, we, we've we actually reverted back in many cases to implementing uh, approaches and strategies that, that have been around for hundreds of years in, in terms of re restrict feeding the pigs. Um, and and uh, I'm always amazed the pig is uh, so resilient, highly adaptive. And, and so where we've gone in and and restrict feeding the pigs to get to their caloric requirements uh, that, that allow them to maintain but not grow. Um, you know, we've actually invoked technology my grandfather used to use. So it's, uh, uh, we've probably reverted uh, more uh, in reverse than we have forward at this time. But, but certainly as an industry, I, I, you know, we believe strongly uh, that, that, you know, we will certainly learn from this in, in terms of harvesting the, uh, the information, understanding the biology uh, of this, I think will, will be, you know, of interest. And, and ultimately I expect we'll be able to improve uh, our, our growth efficiencies on the backside as a result. The collapse of the ethanol industry uh, create a CO2 problem in the processing plants? It, it, it did, and I'm not particularly close to that. I, it, you know, I know at least there was supply chain challenges um, when, when ethanol was, was uh, down for, for, for very short periods of time in the past. And I assume there's you know, challenges now. It's a great question, Todd. I'm not particularly close to that at the moment. Do you have concerns about possible excessive growth in the worldwide uh, China pig industry? Well, I certainly expect that, that, that 
the Chinese will and I'm well aware of, you know, very specific situations where, you know, they're, they're going to grow their industry back and, and, uh, and, and put production back into place. And I would expect that their, uh, their systems of production will evolve uh, on the basis of the knowledge they've gained from, from the African swine fever breaks. And so I, I anticipate that, you know, that while it's a, it's a huge market for us pork today, that, that it will be a, a, a market that, that reduces certainly from its its current volume uh, over time. What's the biggest problem that the industry has with labor? Well, it, it, it's simply the, uh, the 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 fewer number of folks available as a workforce uh, in general. Um, as we look forward, uh, we uh, probably the single greatest thing, and I'm thinking about it now in, in the context of animal caregiving, um, and, uh, but, but in the context of animal caregiving, you know, the, the human capital that, that we're looking to acquire is there are just fewer and fewer individuals in the workforce today that have had prior association with, with, with food animals. And so consequently, they're, they're not even aware of the opportunity. Um, and, and certainly, um, they're, they're, they don't recognize husbandry as a profession. And so there's also a long, much, much longer lead time uh, for us to develop those, the, the available workforce today as a result of that. And, and so uh, we're having to rethink when it is that uh, we introduce uh, available workforce to our industry. We're doing it increasingly more at a young age, uh, but of course it, it's a challenge uh, as we see rural communities, um, you know, become smaller. Quite candidly, one of the things that, that guides our investment thesis is that we want to see an increasingly vibrant rural community. We participate as a partner inside of our rural communities, trying to really enhance uh, them is, is how we think about it because uh, it it is concerning. Uh, we we look to technology as you asked and and continually um, look to ways to monitor animal behavior among among other factors in production uh, to to make management decisions. But we've we've yet to really find a, a viable replacement for that you know human animal caregiver that animal husbandress that that can really understand and read the behaviors of the animals and make the appropriate decisions on their behalf one of your early slides pointed that out that there was a better than $15 average uh, hourly wage for employees um is that a not enough to attract labor and do you have to use immigrant labor primarily uh, to to make this work yeah, we 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 still have a, a tremendous uh, we we have a tremendous uh, U.S. Uh, uh, based workforce, but we do uh, work with with immigration with an immigration program, um, and and of course we find tremendously talented people through that program. Um, but uh, I, I share that just for some perspective. Um, obviously, those are our starting point entry level wages. We, we pay significantly more than that for a number of roles in, inside of our company and, and in our farms. Um, but, but, you know, we're, we anticipate and have seen rapid wage, uh, wage inflation. Uh, we continue for the basis that I just spoke to, to, to we anticipate that will continue to, to, to increase for us. And, and as I mentioned, we focus increasingly more on technology and, and how we might engineer uh, animal care giving increasingly more out of the farm through technology and but it it's it's a real challenge and and from our point of view that the people pig interaction um, is is also you know very important and and, and so um, it, it's a real challenge for our industry that certainly the the packing side of, of, of the industry the packing component of the industry uh, relies my sense would be uh, increasingly more on an immigrant workforce um, and have gone up exponentially through the growth of this industry the last last three to five years. Just a couple of other final questions. Uh, has ASF caused real long-term destruction in, uh, in production in China and other places? 
I think it's done the opposite. I, I think, you know, I mentioned the, the, the GDP growth around the globe and particularly in Southeast Asia really being a catalyst for the expansion of, of the pork industry, certainly here in the US, but that's really true around the globe, as I mentioned. Um, and I think ASF has, has been sort of an accelerant to, to that. Um, and so I think, you know, certainly it caused short term uh, challenges to the Chinese infrastructure. As I mentioned, I, I believe, you know, those folks are, 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 are very sharp and have studied pork production, not only here in the U.S., but around the world and, and are rapid adopters of technology. And so I think you'll see their industry uh, come, come on back online, uh, probably at a similar or, or even greater capacity as a result of deploying those learnings. And in the meantime, um, the, uh, the demand uh, from China to the outside world is spurring growth, not only in, in, in this country, uh, but in, in Brazil in particular. Uh, I think you're seeing uh, significant growth also if you look at the globe in, in Mexico. So South America is, is, is growing its pork sector. And I, I think you'll see uh, Russia also has had significant growth. Uh, it's primarily, at this stage, it's still been limited to domestic, uh, but I certainly would anticipate uh, ambitions for, uh, for export from Russia as well and, and other countries in the Eastern Bloc of Europe. Second to last question here. Um, what's the optimal rate uh, for your slaughter plant to, as a percentage of capacity? Meaning, it, the capacity, and I'm trying to gauge capacity in the U.S. And you know, 100% capacity. Do you run at 98%? Do you run at 72%? What 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 optimizes that rate, and where do we stand today? Yeah, yeah. So obviously, you know, uh, we need them at 110 or 115% today. Um, it, you know, they're designed at, at let's call it 100%, and and no different than than any manufacturing business, uh, farming included, you, you're, you're, what is 100% this year really needs to be 102 or 103% next year. And um, so the packing industry is, is used engineering and, and other innovation approaches and have been very successful uh, if you look at it through time at, at getting additional throughput through these plants. Um, you know, I think uh, basis, uh, our interaction with our customer base today uh, we're optimistic that we're we're going to be back, uh, you know, next week and north of of eighty percent. We're we're hopeful that in the next three uh, months we'll be ninety um, or 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 north. Um, I don't see us, you know, from here to the end of the year hitting, you know, as an industry, um, you know, a hundred percent. And and so I think that that's uh, you know that that's why you know I'm terribly concerned by the 3 million pig backlog. Um, it continues to grow because as I mentioned, we came into the year with, with 100 plus percent of production. And uh, so I, I, I see it growing. We're in, a, we're in a period here in June and July that traditionally there's seasonality in production. Um, and so, you know, there's some optimism that if we can get plants near to 100% in the next few weeks, um, that, that we can, uh, you know, put a dent in that 3 million pig backlog. But, that that's a tremendous amount, you know, of, of overage. So, hey, so just, 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 so January, February, March, you run, the industry is running at a hundred percent before this close 102 or. Yeah, that's right. I, I let's call it a hundred percent. Yeah. It's been difficult for me to track. Uh, there, there are folks that would have that data. Um, but, you know, we've got a lot of new plant startups. I tried to communicate that in my deck, you know, five new plants. They've, none of them really have hit the timeline that they aim to. Um, they all came online at different points. The last one came online last year, but all of them, because of the labor constraints, have mm -hmm. struggled to hit 100%. So, you know, what do you call the percentage of the industry is a tough call at this point. It varies day to day. What do you think the new normal for your company will be? Your family company will be? That's a really great question. Um, I think uh, 
our new normal, we, we have focused uh, really over the last two decades thinking about our business as, you know, customer first. So what is it that the customer demands? And I think we, the new normal will, will be with even greater intensity around that. Uh, we always, always talk to the team about let's begin with the end in mind, whatever we're doing. And so for us, the new norm will we'll focus, you know, very intently on our customer base. It will continue to ask the question of what will the consumer be looking for? And then we'll work backwards to the farm and, and, and all the way to our genetic program to make sure that, that we're innovating in accordance with what the new normal consumer and the supply chain is asking for us. Um, we'll be, you know, taking a look at as we reach some sense of normalcy um, to make sure that our risk management strategies are appropriate. And, and one of the, the real challenges within this industry, certainly in the beef side, as well as my wife and I are, are beef producers, um, is, is price discovery and, and risk management uh, in, in really both industries. Price discovery uh, has, has been, you know, better as a result of those five new plants. Those are generally produce our own plants. So they've created, you know, more, more price discovery in the market, but the contractual nature that the business evolved to similar in beef has created uh, discovery challenges. And then um, there's enormous, enormous basis issues that have resulted. And so where, you know, you manage price risk with the CME um, that has been, uh, you know, really challenged through this and, and their new normal questions uh, to be to be asked and changes needed to, to that system as well. So great question, Todd. I'd be here the rest of the day, I'm afraid, if I, if I tried to tackle all the things, all the questions in my mind as I think about the new norm. It, it, it's, mm-hmm. it's, the, it's the right question. Certainly a mm-hmm. lot of factors. I think we have reached the end of our time. I really appreciate you taking the time with us today, Bradley Walter, and it's been very informative. And thank you to Gary Schnitke and Jim Baltz, who's behind the controls today. I appreciate that. Of course, you've been listening to a Farm Doc Daily Live webinar series called Coronavirus and Ag. This is our 20th in the webinar series and the final one. Thank you for being with us. Uh, There are webinars coming up again next week on Tuesday and Friday. You'll need to go to the Farm Doc Daily website, get yourself all registered for those. Your registration for this one has now ended. Uh, On behalf of the Farm Doc team, I thank you all for joining us today. I'm Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason.